right, are we on? Yeah. All right. Well, welcome everyone to this great experiment in public discussion in the COVID-19 era. This is, uh, my name is Arkan Fung. I teach here at the Kennedy School and I help to organize the democracy programs at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. And I'm delighted here to be able to join this uh, discussion with uh, Peter Dreyer, who's written a fantastic, edited a fantastic book, We Own the Future, about democratic socialism. And uh, apologies in advance for any technical glitches. This is our first video event. And um, our plan here is for Peter and I to talk for about 30 or 40 minutes in a kind of dialogue about the book and associated themes of democratic socialism and pol American politics in our time, and then take uh, an uh, questions from you, the viewer, on uh, YouTube. But as we're having this discussion in the first part of the event, please type your questions in and we'll be collecting them and uh, answering as many as we can uh, at the, in the second half of the event. I'm really excited about this conversation. I think it's really important to do this because at the Kennedy School and in lots of other venues, we don't really talk much about democratic socialism. And in a way, uh, the intellectual discussion is behind the popular political moment and time that we're in. Two out of the, I forget how many, maybe six or seven, two of the, the lasting uh, Democratic primary candidates stood pretty far on the left, and one of them, uh, Senator Sanders, is an avowed Democratic Socialist. Um, and there's nobody better to talk about these themes than Peter Dreyer, who's the uh, Dr. E.P. Clapp Distinguished Professor of Politics uh, and Urban and Environmental Policy at Occidental College in Los Angeles. Before that, he lived in Boston and served as the Director of Housing for the Boston Redevelopment Authority and was a senior uh, policy advisor to Boston Mayor Ray Flynn. He's written many, many books, including Place Matters, Metro Politics for the 21st Century, The Next Los Angeles, Regions That Work, Up and Up Against the Sprawl, which is about uh, Southern California and the LA area. He earned his PhD from the University of Chicago and a BA from Syracuse University. Welcome, Peter. Thanks, great, it's good to be here. Good, good, uh, thanks for coming in. So uh, you've written this uh, great book, which has a lot of dimensions, uh, uh, environment, climate, race, gender, uh, about that, that pivots around democratic socialism called We Own the Future. I thought maybe we'd begin, uh, since some people in the audience may not have a good idea, how would you describe democratic socialism in a nutshell? And how does democratic socialism differ from, say, the progressivism of a Barack Obama. Yeah. So uh, there was a Gallup poll last year that discovered that 43% of all Americans said that they would um, think, they think that socialism would be, would be a, quote, good thing for America. And 58% of um, people 18 to 34 said that socialism would be a good thing for America. So um, the, there's been a huge upsurge of people saying they think some version of socialism would be good for the country. But if you ask them, what does that mean? Yeah. They probably wouldn't have a very good idea. Um, and so we edited this book of uh, original essays to answer that question. Um, and the truth is, uh, I'm sort of dodging your question a little bit, but I'll get to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. We'll, the we'll truth is it. that um, the three editors of the book, myself, Michael Kazin, and Kate Aronoff, and the uh, 25 or so contributors to the book, we don't all agree on what democratic socialism <laughs> would look like. Um, we're trying to spur a debate about what that would be. But I think the underlying uh, agreement of, of all of us in the book is that um, a society as wealthy as the United States should be able to provide a job for everybody at decent wages and provide a social safety net uh, for people who, through the ups and downs of the business cycle or through uh, emergencies, and catastrophes are able to have health insurance, paid family leave, paid vacations, um, be able to retire with dignity, um, and also that corporations are held accountable and responsible for the uh, for the conditions of the environment, for protecting consumers, uh, protecting workers, um, and 
and that people be able to enjoy themselves, uh, be able to not have to slave at their work or uh, work, Americans work longer hours than any other democratic country um, and get decent, uh, decent benefits as a result of that. Um, that sounds like almost every country in Europe and particularly uh, in Scandinavia and to some extent Germany, but it also sounds quite a bit like uh, a kind of watered down version of Canada and Australia. So uh, my view of democratic socialism um, is not that it's some uh, authoritarian communist country, which is the way President Trump is trying to portray uh, all the Democrats as being socialists who love Venezuela and uh, Cuba, but it's, it's closer to Denmark and Sweden, but it has an American accent. Mm -hmm. um, and the American accent uh, is portrayed in the, in the book. So we have a chapter in there about what would sports look like <laughs> uh, we have a chapter in there about how the family would be different. We have a chapter in the book about how, by Naomi Klein, about how uh, we'd rid ourselves of fossil fuels and move towards a more sustainable environment. Um, so people can envision uh, a more livable world, a more visible, a more livable country. Um, and our book tries to spell out what that actually would mean in terms of public policy. So. Um, and what's been interesting is that in this last presidential election, we've had a debate on these issues. Yes. And uh, as we say in the book, the whole country has moved, uh, at least the Democratic Party, but the country has moved to the left. And uh, two good examples is that 78% of all Americans agree with Warren and to some extent Sanders' view of having a 2% wealth tax on people that earn over $50 million a year. That was a radical idea three years ago, Yes. right? Um, when Barack Obama was president, was running for president in 2008, and then he took office, he had this bold idea of increasing the minimum wage to $9 an hour. Okay. Um, public opinion polls now show that the vast majority of Americans think that the federal minimum wage should be $15 an hour, and everybody from Michael Bloomberg to, uh, to Bernie Sanders uh, said that the federal minimum wage should be $15 an hour. So one of the themes of the book and one of the ideas that I think is now fairly commonsensical is that the radical ideas of one time are often the common sense ideas of the next. Yes. And the democratic socialism is now an idea that people are now debating and taking seriously, even if they're not exactly sure what it means. Yes. And so we're in this fascinating time when people are exploring bold new ideas in politics and policy. I think maybe it was Charlotte Alter, I'm not sure if it was her, who said that if you're uh, over 50, what socialism means is the gulag and bad shoes. Uh, yeah. And if you're under 45, what it means is uh, good health care and free university. Yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And so yeah. can you talk a little bit about why you think it is that the debate is opening up. I mean, I guess I'm of the view, taking off from your last point, that if you had proposed, walked into the West Wing in the last couple of years of the Obama era and proposed a 2% wealth tax or Medicare for all with no private option yeah. or, uh, or some of these more steeply progressive tax rates and redistributive policies, uh, you would have been politely escorted out of the room, uh, but yeah. but certainly not engaged in serious debate. Right. And now these ideas are, I don't want to say mainstream because I don't know exactly know what that means, but very much in the public discussion. Yeah, and yeah. so why have things opened up and why are we more open to a wider range of ideas right. than we have been, I think, since 1975 or 1980? Right. Right. Well, uh, one of them was escorted out of the White House. It was, it was Van Jones. <laughs> yeah. right. um, but uh, anyway, so uh, I think the answer to that question has to do with two things. One is there's was the Great Recession of 2008, which uh, where five million people lost their homes to foreclosure and lots of people lost their jobs. And um, it had people questioning the system. Um, and we still really haven't recovered to some extent from the 2008 recession. Um, and so I think part of it is there was this moment in American history in 2008 where it looked like the whole system was about to crumble. And if it wasn't for 
the Obama uh, stimulus package and a few other things, we would have had another deep recession, a, a deep a depression. Um, somebody once said a recession is when uh, uh, is when uh, I'm unemployed and a depression is when no a recession um, is when you're unemployed and a depression is when I'm unemployed. But um, <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, but so I think that happened. But more importantly was the response of ordinary Americans to that phenomena. And the most obvious one was Occupy Wall Street. Um, now, when it happened in September of uh, 2011, it started in Zuccotti Park in New York City, Lower Manhattan, and it spread to hundreds and hundreds of cities all over the country. Um, and within a month or two, most of those occupations had disappeared. But the idea of Occupy Wall Street, which is the 99% and the 1%. That has continued. No politician in America, Republican or Democrat, liberal or conservative, can now run for office without being asked, what are you gonna do about the widening gap between the rich and everybody else? Yes. In terms of wealth and income uh, and the consequences of that. So um, you can kill the movement in some ways, but you can't kill the idea that the movement spawned and I think that began, I mean, even Obama, in one of his great speeches in Kansas, um, after Occupy Wall Street, he said that's the defining issue of our era, is the widening inequality. He didn't do much about it, but he set the tone that mm -hmm. this is something we all have to think about. And since Occupy Wall Street, there's been a whole lot of grassroots movements. Uh, I wrote a piece in the American Prospect a couple weeks ago uh, saying that there were 11 movements that, that defined the last decade. I'm not sure <laughs> I can remember all of them off the top of my head. But um, Occupy Wall Street, the fight for 15, for the, for the raising the minimum wage, uh, the Dreamers and the Immigrant Rights Movement, um, the uh, Green New Deal and the Sunrise Movement and the, and the sort of left wing of the environmental movement, uh, the Me Too Movement and the, uh, the growing demand for uh, women's rights, and that incredible Women's March in January yes. of uh, 2017 were the biggest protest marches in American history of four and a half million people all over the country. The rise of Indivisible, which just came out of nowhere and now has 6,000 chapters all over the country, has trained thousands of people on how to be activists. Um, the, ro the growing tenants' rights movement, Black Lives Matter, um, I'm sure I'm missing one or two, and then the rise of democratic socialism and democratic socialism of America, which was a basically a floundering organization five years ago with three or 4,000 people, now has 60,000 members and chapters in 200 cities. It's amazing. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So all that has happened. And a lot of my students say to me, you know, Professor Dreyer, you're lucky you grew up in the 60s. You know, uh, you grew up in a time of great uh, ferment and radicalization and activism. And I said, you know, there's more activism today in America than there was in the 60s. There were more people involved in protest, in mm -hmm. grassroots movements, in um, working for candidates, uh, progressive and liberal candidates, uh, people going to demonstrations, people lobbying their public officials from the school board to Congress. Um, it's pretty amazing, right? And I think um, that upsurge of activism um, which started before Trump, but has been um, uh, basically enabled by Trumpism, yes. right? The anti-Trump quote resistance movement um, is the is the combination that's helped to uh, move the country and the Democratic Party to the left. And the real issue for me is, um, can they sustain this level of activism if? Uh, a Democrat, likely Joe Biden, gets elected president, mm -hmm. and there's no longer the devil in the White House, basically. Um, and the way I've been framing it in the last uh, week or two is can the, uh, the anti-Trump resistance movement uh, morph itself or transform itself into the push Biden to the left persistence movement? Yes. Um, which is the phrase that Elizabeth Warren likes to use about herself. She, per <laughs> she persisted. But I think it's, you know, it, you know, having a having a devil in the White House is a good recipe for activism. But if we're going to bring about any form of social democracy or democratic socialism in this country, that movement has to stay together. Uh, and 
I think the reason why most of my students and most Americans aren't aware of the incredible upsurge of activism uh, to the point where I, I, I do think, uh, according to polls, there are more people involved now than there were in the 60s, is because each of these movements has its own narrative. Yes. Right. In the 60s, it was civil rights and the, and the anti-war movement and something that the women's movement. Uh, and then later in the 70s, the environmental movement. These movements are a little more confusing. It's not clear who the enemy always is. There's the fossil fuel companies, the National Rifle Association. There's all these other enemies out there besides Trump that are fueling these movements. And so the, um, the whole sometimes seems smaller than the sum of its parts. But I don't think that's true. And, uh, and, uh, and, the, and another great factoid that I think helps explain this is even though the labor movement itself is fairly weak, only about 11% of all American workers are unionized, um, about 64% of Americans told Gallup a couple months ago they'd like to be in a union, mm. which is amazing, right? So there's been an upsurge of people being angry at the way their, their economic fortunes are, are and their, their future uh, are likely to go. And so I think people are looking for answers that uh, are outside the boundaries of what was acceptable in the Obama administration or even prior to that. Uh, and I think even more than the 60s, uh, which had kind of, you know, kind of four revolutionary movements that thought, you know, we were on the brink of a revolution, sort of the ultra left. Uh, people don't think that now. They, I think people are more pragmatic about, um, we can bring about a Denmark-like America um, if we elect the right people and persist in, uh, in organizing uh, on, in the streets, in the grassroots. And that's a very simple kind of inside-outside strategy, yes. which goes back to um, that famous uh, incident, which is probably not true, it's probably apocryphal, but it's still a wonderful story, where a bunch of activists, labor and civil rights activists, came to see Franklin Roosevelt in the White House. Yeah. And they said, uh, here's what we want you to do. Uh, and he said, uh, I agree with everything you said. Now go out and make me do it. Right? Crea help create the political climate that makes it easier for me to be a progressive president. Yes. And I think that's what's necessary, particularly if Biden becomes the president. Because mm, he's good. not going to, on his own, um, take the kind of bold action that's necessary. Interesting. So one thing that I found fascinating with the book is the ways that different authors in the book deal with uh, issues that aren't centrally about class. Mm -hmm. And so democratic socialism uh, in the conventional form insists upon class as the central yeah. axis of conflict. And I think that this, to me, this also characterizes uh, the difference between Bernie 2020 and Bernie 2016. Mm -hmm. Bernie 2016, um, I think, was uh, the, the sum of what he had to offer and what he was talking about. Yeah was much more about uh, completely subsumed under class. Yeah. And socioeconomic uh, inequality is certainly a big part of what he's talking about now. But if you watch any of his, his events, if you look at his support, enormous support among Latinx vote, voters, mm -hmm. um, I had the fortune of, uh, good fortune to see a bunch of the pol uh, political candidate rallies in Iowa uh, and Bernie's was uh, headlined by Pramila Jaipayal and Ilhan mm -hmm. Omar. Right. And so can you talk a little bit about how, uh, in your understanding, the contemporary movement for social democracy, whether it's at the high level of presidential campaigns yeah. or at the grassroots level, is interacting and incorporating issues of gender, of environment, of race in a way that maybe it didn't do so mm -hmm. well in its prior incarnations. Right. Well, the history of the socialist movement is filled with uh, racism and sexism throughout the early 20th century. But one of the leaders of the socialist movement in Milwaukee, which was sort of ground zero for the Socialist Party in the first 30 years of the 20th century, Victor Berger was an out and out racist. Um, Eugene Debs was not a racist, and he understood the importance of having black and white workers together so that they don't, A, they don't scab on each other during strikes, but also sort of from a moral point of view. Um, one of the leaders of the socialist movement is one of my heroines, who not that many people know about, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who was uh, kind of the Gloria Steinem of the early 1900s. She was a socialist feminist, 
Um, and she talked about we have to change the family. We have to, women should have, uh, should have, should have uh, sole responsibility for child care. Um, uh, this is before women could even have the right to vote. Right? So I think that uh, two things have happened. Um, the movements of uh, the feminist movement, the civil rights movement, uh, the environmental movement have forced liberal and democratic uh, candidates to, um, to take, uh, be aware of those issues. Uh, the environmental movement up until the 80s was a white middle class, upper middle class movement. The Sierra Club was almost all white. In fact, the historic, the Sierra, some aspects of Sierra Club were against immigration because they bought the idea that the more people, the, the worse it would be for the environment. Um, a guy named Paul Ehrlich he used to talk sure. that way, an environmental scientist. Um, and then, uh, then the environmental justice movement started and sort of pushed the environmental movement to take, uh, to take be more aware of issues of racial and economic injustice. So where are the toxic facilities and who, uh, who uh, shoulders the burden of uh, most of the environmental health problems, people of color and poor people. Um, and so I think that's now part of the, the progressive movement's DNA. And um, uh, uh, Naomi Klein, who has a chapter in yes. our book, the great uh, environmental writer, um, talks about what a, uh, a fossil fuel free country would look like, right? Um, but what she says and what several other people have been saying in the last decade or so, last uh, few years or so, is that we can't just have an environmentally sustainable society without full employment. So there has to be some awareness of uh, keeping people working at decent jobs while we're re eliminating the fossil fuel mm -hmm. stuff. And, um, and the jobs that are likely to be eliminated are disproportionately jobs that women and people of color have in, those, in the fossil fuel sectors. And so there, have to be, um, there has to be a, a just transition that accommodates that. And um, immigration is an issue that is both class and separate from class. And uh, there's no way that a progressive movement today can avoid the issue of, of immigration. Michelle Chen, who writes for The Nation, has uh, the chapter in our book on immigration policy. That's probably one of the more controversial chapters in the book. As I said, not everybody in the book uh, agrees with each other, and not all the editors agree with, our, uh, with each other about this. And she basically calls for, um, for open borders, which I, I don't agree with. Um, but um, that's a case that a lot of people need to at least, uh, they need to at least deal with that mm -hmm. issue. Um, and then another issue which is both class and race is criminal justice reform, right? So um, when Bernie ran in 2016, he was attacked by Black Lives Matter uh, at one of his big rallies for not paying enough attention to the concerns of black people, particularly about mass incarceration and the racism of the criminal justice system. Um, and then they met with Hillary Clinton. And now no Democrat's gonna run for office for president or Senate without thinking about um, racial profiling by police, uh, getting rid of cash bail, addressing the privatization of the prison system, dealing with um, the double standard on criminal justice penalties and uh, sentencing reform. All those issues are things that the, that the left has to deal with now. And unlike, um, some of the people in the book and some younger socialists uh, affiliated with uh, DSA, for example, I don't think we can do away with prisons. I don't think we can do, do away with police. Norway, I looked this up once, just uh, in the middle of a debate about this. Norway has more police per capita than the United States. Right? <laughs> um, but they don't, you know, but they, but they have a much smaller prison population, yes. right? Um, <laughs> so um, anyway, so I think there's a lot of the issues that you're talking about that have a class component, uh, you know, because clearly who goes to prison? Poor people and people of color, right? Um, and the real issue in our criminal justice system is, you know, we, we police and put people in jail for engaging in crime in the streets, but not crime in the suites. Mm -hmm. And so even, um, even under the Obama administration, not one banker went to jail, right? Um, and, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of bankers that should be in jail. One of them is Jamie Dimon, who's the uh, CEO of, um, of uh, Morgan, uh, Chase, Morgan Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase. 
And he's now being talked, at least the rumor mill is, that he might be a cabinet secretary in the Biden administration, like the Treasury Secretary. Um, that itself would be a crime if that happened. And I assume it won't happen, right? Um, so, um, you know, class issues don't disappear. Uh, but, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. Bernie, for most of his life, was a fairly sectarian leftist, Marxist leftist. Um, and uh, when he was elected mayor of Burlington in, I think, uh, 1982, he had to sort of temper that because he had to now, I, I have to deliver the goods. I got to get the, the snow removed, right? I got to make sure that there are, um, uh, you know, the basketball nets in the playgrounds are not broken. And so he, he sort of tempered that, but he still remained kind of an orthodox radical socialist. Yeah. And in the four years since he ran for election, the first time for president, he's definitely changed. And then um, Elizabeth Warren brought in a whole nother sort of feminist uh, view, and she's always been pretty good on, uh, on race, racial issues, on immigration. And so the whole political climate about those issues has changed. So Very good. it's not as if we've uh, socialists don't talk about class and the, the widening gap between the rich and the poor and the concentration of wealth and the need for a for more progressive taxation. But they've uh, added to the um, to the to the menu of socialist ideas. Yeah, good. So uh, I want to shift a little bit to the challenges of democratic socialism in the American context. Democratic yeah. socialists believe that. Um, in order to get to a better society, you need big government, and yeah. therefore big government can be very good government. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, many Americans, uh, part of the American ethos, at least since uh, Ronald Reagan said that government is uh, not the solution to your problems, government is the problem, yeah. have sunk in an almost uh, visceral yeah. reaction to the idea that big government could be positive. Right. So. Is that a deal breaker for democratic socialism in America? The the negative sensibility about yeah, big government that, right. that doesn't exist in Western Europe. So, uh, and not only did Reagan say that government is not the solution but the problem, but a couple years later, Bill Clinton said that the era of big government is over. Right. Right. Trying to move the Democratic Party towards right. the center. Um, and democratic socialists disagree with both Bill Clinton yeah, and Ronald Reagan that's on right. that score. Ab absolutely. So. Well, we're in the middle of probably the worst public health crisis in our lifetimes, right? And so your question is completely germane and relevant to what's happening in America right now. The failure of the federal government, of the, of the Trump administration, to actively mobilize all the resources around the health issues, um, around paid family leave. Uh, Steve uh, Greenhouse had a great column in the uh, American Prospect a couple weeks ago, a week ago, about how um, the public health crisis has gotten worse because we don't, like, unlike every other democratic country in the world, we don't have paid family leave, so people, and sick leave, so people aren't, uh, have to go to work when they're sick. Um, the, uh, in the news just to, uh, today, uh, Donald Trump said there is, they're thinking about cutting taxes on business again as a way to stimulate the economy as if that's going to make a difference in the um, in this public health crisis. So um, when Americans face a crisis, they want a big government to help protect them. Um, whether it's a tornado or a hurricane or, or a recession or a depression or a public health crisis, um, they recognize the importance of, quote, big government. Um, and if you listen to public opinion polls, uh, most Americans think that the federal government has a responsibility to provide some version of universal health insurance um, to protect consumers from unsafe products. I mean, um, Michael Harrington, the sort of founder of Democratic Socialist America, once said that most Americans are liberal, conservative, um, and, uh, and radical at the same time, the same people, right? Depends on, on what the question is that's being asked, right? So. Um, in, in uh, 1911, the first socialist elected to Congress, this guy named Victor Berger that I mentioned before from Milwaukee, he proposed something called old age insurance. The federal government should have old age insurance. And it got two votes, his vote and Meyer London, who's the other socialist in Congress from New York. And then 23 years later, uh, Franklin Roosevelt introduced Social Security. At the time, 
a lot of the pundits, a lot of the editorial pages of newspapers, the entire business community, the right wing, the sort of the trunks of the depression, said this is socialism, this is going to Sovietize America, but uh, they passed Social Security anyway. And now, more than 90% of Americans, including most conservatives and most Republicans, think that Social Security is a good idea and that we shouldn't mess with it. And when George Bush tried to, George W. Bush tried to mess with it, uh, the Republicans rejected it. So, um, is Social Security big government? I suppose, yes, right? Do most Americans think it's a good idea? Yes, right? So, in theory, people don't like big government. <laughs> but in practice, people want big government. Um, and the question is, who's the messenger for that? And it's possible that somebody that calls himself a democratic socialist, Bernie Sanders, may not be the best messenger <laughs> for that. Yes. Whereas Elizabeth Warren, I think, would have been a better messenger and still is, I think, a better messenger for that. Um, and even Biden, like I said earlier, has moved to the left. Um, and what is, you know, regardless of whether he's, uh, you call him a centrist or a liberal, he's saying things that Obama never would have said, mm -hmm. right? like a $15 federal minimum yeah. wage and uh, some version of a Green New Deal, although his version isn't what uh, AOC wants. Um, so I think the the issue of big government is used as a hammer against the, you know, didn't want a king, right? They didn't want a central authority telling them what to do. So that our, our fear of big government goes back a long way. But the New Deal sort of changed all that. And um, even though Reagan said that government's the problem and, and Clinton said that we need less big government, that era of big government is over, um, the idea that we need government to protect the environment, to protect consumers, to protect workers, and to protect public health is still out there, and most Americans agree with it. Mm, very good, very good. So, uh, your one of your co-editors, the remarkable American historian Michael Kazin, wrote in an op-ed, I think it was in the Post, that uh, changed the debate, opening it up, but then also, as you say, pulled uh, the Democratic Party, or at least in this period of the primaries, quite to the left. Right. So do you, I, I guess I want to pose two possible theses. One is Michael's thesis that Bernie has already won. Is that right? But then the other possibility, uh, which looks likely at this point, if you follow the primaries, is that uh, Bernie will lose the Democratic nomination. And that could be a gut punch to a lot of the people, especially the young people who are so enthusiastic about him and the politics that he represents. Yeah. So um, Michael Kazin is one of my friends that I uh, admire <laughs> his, his history writing. Um, and it is true, as he wrote in that op-ed piece, um, that uh, more people are now in sync with what Bernie Sanders has been saying than at ever time before. But to say that Bernie Sanders has already won, that's kind of a pure victory. Donald Trump is re-elected president, <laughs> right? So... Um, I think that's a little uh, a little glib, right? Um, uh, we have to make sure that um, under any circumstances, uh, Donald Trump doesn't get reelected president, and they get at least 50 votes in the Senate. Uh, and if that happens, I think we can move the country in a more progressive direction if the grassroots movements uh, align with what they've been doing the last couple of years. Like I said, if the resistance movement becomes the persistence movement. Um, I think we also have to, I've been a big fan of Bernie Sanders for many years. Uh, when I worked in, in City Hall in Boston, and he was the mayor of Burlington, I didn't know kind of mayor he was, and uh, it was a kind of glowing uh, portrayal of his, of his uh, administration in uh, over eight years. Um, and he has definitely been an inspiring figure. He has played a pivotal role. Uh, he will not be a footnote in American history. He will be a, a key player in American history. He's He's had a big introduction to your yeah. book. I'm trying to think about whether this is right or not, yeah. but the, the claim that Senator Sanders is the most prominent socialist in American history. He is. I mean, that, I, that's quite a striking well, claim. Well, particularly in an <laughs> yeah. era of mass, of mass media yeah. and, and social media, more people know who, uh, who Bernie Sanders is than ever knew who Eugene Debs was, huh. right? Um, uh, and, you know, and Bernie Sanders admires Eugene Debs. He has this photo in his uh, office in Washington. But the answer to your question, I think, is that we have to be able to envision 
an American socialism without Sanders and without Trump, right? The two defining people that have helped to <laughs> shape this uh, moment, shape of, the this moment yeah. of American yeah. history are Bernie Sanders and yeah. Donald Trump. And if we can get rid of, you know, yeah. if we can get rid of Trump, that's yeah. good. We don't have to get rid of Sanders. He'll stay in the Senate. But there has to be a new generation of people who will be the next versions of Bernie Sanders. And that is already happening with the most obvious example of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, who's just a remarkable politician. And actually, uh, in some ways, I would say, um, and uh, she's a, you know, she understands the importance of building a movement that's not just a rhetorical our revolution, but you know, the nuts and bolts of organizing on the ground. Um, this is not the place to criticize the sort of the nuts and bolts strategy of the Bernie Sanders uh, campaign. Um, he's been a remarkable figure. Um, but I don't think we need Bernie Sanders to promote the ideas that we attach to Sanderism, uh, you know, socialist ideas. Um, they have a life of their own, but they do need spokespeople. Yes. Right? And um, I think it was a, um, a clever uh, move on Elizabeth Warren's part it didn't help her, but it was still a clever move to say, I'm a capitalist to my bones. Mm -hmm. But um, that's not really true. I mean, she's a capitalist in the sense that she doesn't believe in the public ownership of the means of production, but neither does Bernie Sanders, right? Yeah, neither um, is socialist in that sense. Right, yeah. So um, if you look at where they stand on issues, here's here's the way I, I've portrayed it in, uh, in things I've written uh, and, and talks I've given. If you had a, um, a scale of progressivism from zero to 100, with 100 being the most progressive, meaning some version of democratic socialism, uh, Trump would be a zero. Uh, Biden would be about a 70 or 75. Elizabeth Warren would be a 97, and Bernie would be a 99. <laughs> right? um, and so the, the debate, I think, now is can we move Biden from being a 75% mm -hmm. progressive to an 80 or 85 percent progressive, um, and then my hope would be that he'll be a one-term president because he's old; he won't run for re-election. Um, that in uh, in the next four years, Elizabeth Warren is the um, assuming that the Democrats take back the Senate. Elizabeth Warren replaces Chuck Schumer as the Senate Majority Leader. That gives her an opportunity to sort of help Biden to the left, and then in 2024. Uh, Elizabeth Warren is the candidate, and um, assuming that um, that Biden's had some successes at getting legislation passed, including improving Obamacare for more people, uh, whatever version of Medicare for all there is, I don't think they should eliminate the uh, private insurance companies. I don't think that will happen anyway. Um, then Elizabeth Warren runs for president, and um, as you were saying earlier. I assume, you know, right now, if I were betting, I'd bet she'd, she'd be running against Nikki Haley, uh, the Republican candidate, is how I would predict. So I think 2024 is going to be interesting. You're going to have a Southern uh, person, of, a woman of color, uh, who's basically uh, a corporate conservative against a, a left-wing woman uh, from, um, from Massachusetts. And I think that would that will help define America for the next two generations, and I think the young people of America that have been supporting Bernie um, will continue to support this, you know, some version of democratic socialism if um, Ocasio Cortez and people like her um, rise to the occasion, which I'm sure she will, and tell people, "Hey, you got to vote for Biden, whether you like, hold your nose, but vote for Biden." Uh, get good people elected to the Senate, to the House, to the state legislature, to the city council. The Democrats have not been very good. They've been much worse than the Republicans at developing a farm team of progressives to run for yes. office, starting at the school boards and city councils. And we need to start doing that. Gingrich started that process with Republicans in the 90s, did a great job. We're seeing a lot of those people. More common sense than I think a lot of the public uh, intellectuals and pundits give them credit for. There's always going to be, I think, a small slice of the Bernie Krat, ultra left, you know, Chapo House, whatever you call those people, kind of nut, nut jobs, um, who will stay home 
if um, if Trump wins uh, in those swing states by let's say three thousand votes mm -hmm. in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, then um, those people should go to hell. Yeah. <laughs> um, so hopefully they will come out to vote, and if they don't, um, they deserve the scorn and abuse that will hopefully be, uh, be uh, given them. And uh, I think, but the most young people that I know, and I go around the country, give a lot of talks to at colleges, are much more pragmatic, mm -hmm. uh, similar to the way the African American vote was in this last primary season, where yes. most African Americans probably shared, were more closer in their political views to either Bernie or Elizabeth Warren than they were to Biden, but they voted for Biden because they want to beat Trump. Mm -hmm. yeah. And hopefully young people will uh, will come around uh, the same way. Make that strategic yeah. calculation. Yeah. Looking to the future, um, it's easy in this political season and in, you know, for those of us who are who mainline political <laughs> information yeah. Yeah. to focus on uh, the candidates and the people. And you've already suggested something that I think you and I share that Ultimately, it, it's not about the, the candidates. The individuals are ephemeral. Right. It is uh, what you said, the farm link, other things that are going on. And one interesting feature of this moment is there are, um, there are sets of practices and groups and uh, methods that are, I don't know, Gramsci might have called them counter-hegemonic, uh, uh -huh. even to the mainstream uh, democratic establishment, if you want to call it that. Uh, that are just different and new. Uh, and I think part of this, absolutely essential, I think, to opening up the debate has been Bernie's business model of small donor donations right. that liberates him from certain kinds of donor influence. Right. I think uh, that's not going anywhere. Somebody else will be able to Agreed. reproduce that kind of mechanism. Another is a group of people who are in elected office, the most prominent ones are in Congress now, yeah. like AOC, but then also others who have a very different set of insurgent politics. Right. Uh, and then uh, in our world, in the intellectual world, I find it interesting that, um, well, DSA has certainly, as you said, increased in membership um, a lot, but that there are people maybe in the generation after us who have uh, forums for speaking and journals that are different from the ones that we right. read that aren't right. the nation or the new republic right. or right. dissent but right. for the highbrow folks it's jacobin for the lower brow it's yeah. chapo trap house there is yeah. uh, there are spaces of discourse around democratic socialist ideas right. kind of going on and i wonder how you're seeing you know it's it's those rooms those living rooms those right. spaces that right. enable these different ideas to be developed. And I see that as something quite yeah. new in just the last couple of years. Yeah, social media is disparate. Sure. Um, I still think that most of politics that works is face-to-face. -face. Um, but you can bring people face-to-face -face through social media. Um, that's what Indivisible did, for example. Um, I think in addition to the things you mentioned. Yeah, what are, are the I, others you know, on the scene? I, I that think you're Indivisible noticing. is remarkable. Yes. So, you know, a couple of months after Trump was elected, uh, this, this they were angry and frustrated about what was going on in the country. They wrote this manual for progressives on how to lobby your Congress and how to organize. Um, they put it up on their website. They got help from some of their friends. Um, within a day, it had crashed because there were so many people. <laughs> right, so many people wanted to see yeah. it. Yeah, and, uh, and, it went, and it became more than a manual. It became a movement. Um, and now there are 6,000 chapters of indivisible that's amazing in yeah. every congressional district and um some of them are running for office uh they, they which I, feeds into the farm team yes that you were talking exactly about. Yeah. um some uh in 2018 i think indivisible was as responsible as anyone else including the planned parenthood and other groups but i think indivisible played a huge role in increasing voter turnout the voter turnout in 2018 was higher than in any midterm election since 1914 including among young people and people of color and women, and they tended to vote for Democrats, which is why you had such, they flipped 40 seats in the House. Um, Indivisible is remarkable. I did a, uh, a, a journalistic piece a couple years ago where I talked to a guy who um, lives in uh, Montclair, New Jersey, uh, in the 11th Congressional District, um, and they had a long-term conservative Republican whose family goes back in New Jersey to the Revolutionary War. Called Fralin Heisen family. 
and he'd been in Congress in that seat for uh, 30 years, and he, he inherited from his father, right? Um, and he had become increasingly conservative. And so people were angry at him because in Montclair and Morristown, New Jersey, the center of this district, uh, more people were moving slightly. It was a purple district moving to the left. And so he um, put up a Facebook page. He called it um, Congressional District 11 for Change, CD11 for Change. And he said, I'm going to have a meeting at the Starbucks in downtown Morristown. If anybody wants to come and figure out what we can do about getting rid of Frelinghuysen, our right-wing Republican congressperson, please show up at the Starbucks at you know nine in the morning or whatever. He, you know, when I interviewed him, he said he, he thought maybe 12 people would show up. 400 people showed up, <laughs> and they knew they had a movement. Um, to make a long story short, Frelinghuysen decided not to run for re-election, and they elected Mickey Shirell, a, a moderate to liberal Democrat in that district. And that wouldn't happen without Facebook. And these weren't just young people, right? So I think um, you're absolutely right. There's a, a, ch a change in the conversation, uh, and there are these other venues. Um, uh, uh, Jacobin, to me, is a little too cynical. Sure, about yeah. Their, I mean, the, we could say lots news. about yeah. the problems right. of these different but I, I th venues. I, I, I just think pointing it's out you're the absolutely right. the, their existence. Yeah, I yeah. think you're absolutely right that we've now expanded the room for public debate about these issues. Um, and... Uh, the people who are uh, sort of the public intellectuals of the of the, our current era are people who um, have a, particularly young people, yeah. who have a much more, um, I think, pragmatic view than the radicals of the 60s mm -hmm. about how you get from here to there. Uh, and that, that pleases me. I'll tell you one thing I'm not happy about, about the world of public intellectuals. Um, I think at almost every university and college in America right now, there are a lot of uh, professors in the social sciences and the humanities that would call themselves radicals or socialists, uh, feminists. Um, but they see their role as public intellectuals and as teachers of uh, criticizing, sometimes they say deconstructing or interrogating, you know, these postmodern phrases, but you know, uh, the, the, the existing system and telling students how awful things are and how everything is racist and everything is, you know, there's all these hidden meanings in everything, right? Uh, and everybody is, um, there's no truth, there's just points of view, right? I think that is incredibly destructive because students want to know what can we do, right? Um, and a lot of the professors that I know at my own college and at other colleges basically say, in essence, that's not my job. My job is to tell you how awful things are, right? I think it's very paralyzing. I think that's academic uh, misconduct. Um, and I think um, it's really awful that um, uh, a lot of our students are now exposed to professors, uh, again, mostly in the humanities and social sciences, that have a critique of capitalism but don't know who their congressperson is. <laughs> you know? And I think that has to change. Mm -hmm. Do you I think that it is changing? It, that may be an artifact of our generation. Uh, well, your, your generation is different yeah, than my yeah, generation. Right. I Both think it's an artifact of your generation. Yeah, probably is, my generation. Yeah, that's, which is, yeah, you know, that's probably uh, correct. Yeah. yeah, people who are now in their late 30s and 40s, yeah. and maybe or early 50s. Bit, yeah, early 50s. You yeah. know, who, um, who uh, grew up, uh, became academics at a period of um, mass cynicism and never kind of, you know, and like the idea that there, I mean, when I was in graduate school and uh, beginning my career as a professor, um, being a radical was was fraught with a lot. I mean, you, could, you know, it's hard to get a job yeah. if you were a radical, much less a you know, or even a Marxist. But that's not a problem anymore. There's plenty. You know, the universities are filled with Marxists and feminists and people that deal with uh, racism and um, so forth. And uh, there's a big upsurge of queer studies. I think that's all great, right? What's not great is that much of the new wave of radicalism is about what's wrong and not about what to do. Yeah. And in my field of political science and sociology, I think that's particularly true, right? Um, and it really bothers me that um, that you have all these sort of, what used to be called armchair radicals, right? Who, um, who, who don't offer any hope. Oh, there are. I can see coming here. Oh. <laughs> Oh, great. So keep hope alive is my yeah. message. Yeah, right. Yeah. I hope that yeah. 
Yeah, I think that, uh, I, I guess my hope is that that will change as the political scene seems to offer more opportunities well, I for think constructive I, what reform. I, what I think action. is that a lot of the students yeah. are kind of ignoring their, their professors about this and kind of, despite what they're learning in the classroom, are, are yeah. becoming more activists. Mm -hmm. But I think groups like Jacobin, were, and I've actually written a couple of pieces for Jacobin, are not helpful in that sense. Mm -hmm. I, think they, I think they encourage cynicism. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we have a, a couple of uh, questions. One from okay. probably, you probably know her, and I, I do too, our friend Hillary Silver. Do you know uh, her? Yes, yeah. Sure, yeah. So <laughs> Hillary um, comments, if Bernie is a democratic socialist, he's also a populist who has some authoritarian tendencies. And then my colleague, Mr. Mich uh, Muriel Royer, uh, comments on um, Hillary's thought and says, uh, you compare Trump and Bernie on authoritarianism, and she indicates that um, that that's not an appropriate yeah. analog. Yeah, am I allowed to say bullshit? <laughs> you should say anything you okay. want. Okay, Hillary, uh, if you're listening or watching, I I think you're totally wrong. Uh, you know, Bernie Sanders. Hillary, has, right back. Yeah, Ber <laughs> Bernie Sanders has a lot of faults, you know, but being an authoritarian is not one of them. I mean, uh, uh, he's a yelly. He he ran, he ran he ran uh, Bur Burlington in a very uh, democratic grassroots way. I mean, it, it, it was a pretty weak mayor system, so he didn't have a lot of authority. Um, I just don't think that's right. I mean, and to compare Sanders with Trump on on any scale of authoritarianism um, is really outrageous. I mean, yeah. So to be fair, uh, Hillary didn't compare Bernie to Trump. Yeah. She she said maybe he has some authoritarian tendencies. I mean, yeah. I mean, when I get when I used to get angry at my kids when they were young, I you know, sometimes I'd yell at them when I probably shouldn't have, right? We all have some authoritarian <laughs> tendencies, right? But um, you know, Bernie Sanders for whatever faults he has and I do think he has faults around his uh, his somewhat sectarian view of how you run for office. He built a grassroots movement, you know, of people and he, and uh, of people all over the country, uh, and I think and uh, where there's local control of, you know, you know, he doesn't tell people who to endorse for mayor and city council. He doesn't try to get his group Our Revolution to, you know, be heavy-handed. Um, I think they made a lot of mistakes, but that doesn't mean there's authoritarian. Donald Trump is a is a wannabe fascist dictator. I mean, he's, you know, he's outside the boundaries of anybody who's ever been president of the United States, ever, right? Um, and uh, and he's a racist, and he's a megalomaniac, and I mean, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, Bernie Sanders is none of that, you know? I mean, every politician I know, and I know many of them, they all have big egos. I mean, you don't run for office if you don't have a big ego, if you don't think you can solve people's problems. Um, but, you know, we know a lot of people, you know, who are in Congress and in state governments and so forth, who use that sense of self-confidence and ego to improve the world and to make life more livable. And that's how Bernie spent most of his career. Um, so you got to give him credit for that. I, mean, I, I supported Bernie four years ago. I, I supported Elizabeth Warren this time. I didn't think Bernie would make a great president. But to say that he and Trump both have authoritarian tendencies to me is um, another version of academic malpractice. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, Monica in the audience, I'm not sure I'm getting the first point. So if you want to type in, Monica, if you're still on the line, clarify. She says, uh, many big governments are good and, low, uh, and have low corruption, but she thinks, uh, and this is the part that I'm not quite getting, support for redistribution is low in unequal societies. Oh, I guess I do at that point because it's a chicken egg problem. If you don't have a lot of support for redistribution in an unequal society, that's yeah. why it's unequal. Yeah. So she asks, can a small government reduce inequalities and is so high? I suspect you think, no, you yeah, need more right, government. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Let me, let me, uh, but before I go there, let me go yeah. back to one more thing I probably should have said in response to Hillary's question. There are people inside Bernie's campaign who I think have uh, hurt him a lot. Hmm. by uh, attacking Elizabeth Warren, by being nasty, by being uh, in some ways authoritarian on their own, being incredibly sexist. That it's a small slice of his followers. He um, rebuked them publicly, but I don't think he did it enough. Mm -hmm. 
you kind of said every campaign has people like that. I think there's more people in the Bernie campaign like that that kind of see Bernie as almost like a religious figure. That's not, I mean, Bernie doesn't see himself that way. But there are some people that um, kind of, it's Bernie or nobody, which is just crazy. You can't, you can't be in politics in America that way. So, although I don't think Bernie is an authoritarian, I don't think his campaign is authoritarian uh, or top down in the way that I think she meant. I think there are some people on the crazy left wing of Bernie's campaign that fit that description in some ways. But to, get, to answer your other question, you can't redistribute wealth uh, in any meaningful way at the local or state level. You need a federal government to do that. Um, but there was an experiment done by one of your colleagues at Harvard and somebody at Vanderbilt a couple years ago, you're probably familiar with this, where they asked um, a sample of a random sample of Americans um, what their belief was, what was the current level of inequality in America, what was their ideal level oh, yes. of, yeah. of inequality, yeah. and what was the reality. And 90% of Americans said they wanted, when they were asked this question, they wanted, their ideal was something closer to what they have in Scandinavia. What they thought the country was, was um, less egalitarian than Scandinavia, but, um, but more egalitarian than the reality. And so, you know, the vast majority of Americans think that this disparity in wealth and income is awful. That doesn't mean they believe in reparations or they believe in um, free, you know, free, uh, free uh, university education. They want, they think, and I agree with this actually, I think that um, people, I don't want Bill Gates' kids getting a free college education from the government, right? So I may disagree with some of with the more left people in the Democratic Party. Right. universalism yeah, yeah. in that regard. Um, yeah. but, um, but most people think that, you know, students should not have to graduate from college with 10 or 20 or 50,000 hours worth of debt. So, mm. and you can't fix that problem in California or New Jersey or New Mexico, right? Yeah, good. There just isn't enough, there aren't enough resources. Yeah. Um, so John Sisterno, who is uh, at the Tobin Project uh, in Cambridge, asks, he says, polls show long-term majorities uh, are in favor of some sort of social provision of health care. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. solid. Yeah. But then he says, but when there's a policy proposed, you can change public opinion by stressing the costs of health care. Yeah. So what do you think about that? That that really, I mean, I'll, I'll put John's question a little more sharply, is that the off left-sided yeah. poll statistic that everybody wants yeah. universal health care, you can easily puncture that yeah. by saying, look, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Do you still want it? Yeah. I think um, uh, the press did an incredible disservice on that question when they dealt with um, Bernie and uh, Elizabeth Warren's uh, efforts to explain what they meant by Medicare for all. Um, the press, the moderators of the debates kept saying, but aren't you going to increase taxes, right? And Bernie in particular, but both of them kept saying, um, the, they wouldn't address the tax issue, which I think was a dodge they should have, they should have confronted directly, but that taxes will go up less than costs will go down. That if you, you know, in terms of your uh, your co-payments, right. your I think there was a JAMA article that showed yeah. that, and like yeah. on net costs yeah. will go down. The net cost of health insurance yeah. for the vast majority of Americans will go down under e any of their plans. Um, but um, all the media focused on is that they were lying about taxes, right? As opposed, and they were trying to make the case about the cost of health care. So the answer to the question is that if Americans understood that their health care costs would go down, even if their taxes went up, right? That for the, you know, for the upper middle class. Yeah, you know, your co-pays, yeah, your deductibles. Yeah, right, you know, yeah. that, um, that it would, uh, it's a net gain. Um, I think most people would say that's a, a good thing, but the media would not let them say that. Um, and I think that's, that was an incredible disservice. And, you know that Trump is, is gonna to try to confuse the public about that as well. But I also think, I believe in Medicare for all. I believe in a system like Canada, a kind of a, a single payer system. But I think it was a political mistake for both Bernie and for Warren to raise their hand when they asked, do you wanna do, do away with private health insurance? I think that is something that has to evolve over time as people see that the public sector health insurance 
is preferable to the private sector health insurance, and they will make the decision for themselves. And I think uh, Pete Buttigieg actually uh, was very smart in saying that. You know, let let the people decide, right? Now, I know there are issues about, um, you know, if you have a, uh, uh, a private health care system, they'll get all the healthy people and the public sector yeah, will yeah, get all the yeah. unhealthy people. There's an insurance issue yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. So another way to think about that would be to have a uh, – to have, instead of having a public option, to have a private option. That everybody is enrolled in a public that health the insurance. The public is the default. Yeah. yeah. And that if you want to uh, default and have private insurance, you can do that. Um, and this came to a head in Nevada where the culinary workers yes, union, right. which had fought really, really hard to get a great health care plan that cost them very little. And it's a family plan. And some of the people in the union were saying, we don't want to do. We don't want to get rid of this. Yeah. Now, ultimately, health insurance should not be based on where you work or if you work. But in the interim, I think people need to see a transition. And I think it was a mistake for both Bernie and Elizabeth Warren to um, to, to basically take public uh, private health insurance off the table entirely because they could easily get um, attacked on that, and they did. And it, it particularly hurt Warren. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. So we have time for one more question. This is from Miles Rappaport, and Miles asked uh, appropriately to you because you've done so much work on metropolitan areas and uh, city city governments. Uh, he asks about the progress at the state and local level, but I'll put the question more sharply. Uh -huh. If you're a democratic socialist, yeah. should you pin your hopes on national level reform or particular state and local activity? Yeah, that's a great question. Hi, Miles. We're all friends. We go back 40 years. I sang at his wedding. So, <laughs> um, um, so <clears throat> the uh, Eugene Debs ran for president six times and he never won. He never got more than 6% of the vote. <laughs> Meanwhile, Milwaukee uh, was the uh, ground zero of socialism in America. And uh, there was a, a socialist mayor in Milwaukee between 1910 and 1960 for 50 years. Um, and in their heyday in the 1920s and 30s, they ran the most efficient government in the country. They uh, revolutionized public health. They increased the parks. They had the best park system in the country. Uh, they had one of the best school systems in the country. The socialists were, um, Milwaukee became a laboratory for, for the socialism. Uh, and a lot of other cities that weren't socialist adopted the, a lot of the ideas, particularly the infrastructure that, uh, that Milwaukee had pioneered. In fact, they were so proud of what they did that they called themselves the sewer socialists. Yes, I remember. Um, <laughs> and uh, my mother grew up in Reading, Pennsylvania. They had a uh, socialist mayor. Uh, Minneapolis had a socialist mayor. So um, I'm a strong believer in local government doing whatever it can to improve people's lives. and. Uh, there are now six DSA members uh, on the city council of Chicago, yes. which of course has 50 people in the city council. So, but um, that's six more than there were there five years ago, right? So uh, there's a wonderful organization called Local Progress, which is a network of uh, progressive, radical, and socialist local and state officials that come together a couple times a year to talk about what they're doing and how they did it. So I think that's important, and I think socialists need to, uh, and radicals and progressives, uh, need to work at the local level. I spent uh, eight years working for the city of Boston for Mayor Ray Flynn. Uh, he was a progressive mayor, and I think we did a lot of good things with rent control and job training and lots of other good things. Um, but um, you can't solve the housing and homelessness crisis at the local level. There's not enough money. Uh, uh, even if you change all the zoning laws and you had rent control, you can't solve – you need those things, but you can't solve all those problems. You can't create a full employment economy at the local level. You can't uh, uh, address the environmental crisis entirely at the local level. You have to do all things simultaneously. And I think that's what's interesting about what's happening in America now is that people are running for office as progressives and radicals and socialists. And they're, uh, and they're acknowledging that we can't solve all the problems here, but we can make a, uh, we can make a good start. Um, the reason why Seattle 
was the first city in the country to have a fifteen dollar minimum wage mm -hmm. is because they had a socialist city council member oh, that's right. uh, who was not a DSA member who pushed that issue, uh, got the mayor to go along with her to sort of you know they had kind of a a good a good cop bad cop thing. Uh, she pushed the fifteen dollar minimum wage right away. He said let's do it over three or four years. The mayor did. Um, the business community initially opposed it, but then some of them came around and said, we've got to do this. Um, and she had a big impact. And uh, the business community ganged up on her in the last election a couple months ago. They tried to defeat her. She beat them. Um, so I think having um, progressives at the local level is important. Uh, they can do good things. It also becomes, as I said earlier, a kind of farm system for the next level, for people running yes. for state legislature. And the, and the other thing is, if you don't fight the fight at the state level, if you don't get a majority of uh, at least Democrats, much less progressives, in state legislatures, they control redistricting for the, for the House of Representatives. And um, we gotta do something about gerrymandering. So, yeah. um, you know, and so like, for example, uh, a couple of socialists were elected to the Virginia state legislature. A is couple that right? Yeah. And uh, I didn't know about that. One. Yeah, and um, you know, and they're not a majority, but they have, <laughs> I wouldn't think so. But, but they have like a progressive caucus, yeah. you know, and the progressive caucus in Congress and is uh, is much bigger than it's ever been. Uh, that's why you had such a great 2018. Uh, and in New York City, where my friend Brad Lander is on the city council, sure. he started the progressive caucus there. Uh, he's now running for citywide office, and he built um, a movement in New York based on the fact that he was not only a progressive city council member, he um, he helped bring other people along, and he's got a lot of credibility. I hope he wins uh, his race. But um, And he was one of the founders of Local Progress. So he understood the importance of building a national network. And so I don't think it, I don't think working at the local, the state, and the federal level are mutually exclusive. Are either or. So right. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, simply running people for office is not enough. You have to keep the movement alive. Um, in between election cycles, you have to keep people in motion on uh, on, on issue campaigns, mm -hmm. whether it's environmental issues or healthcare issues or crime issues or whatever. People need to stay involved. And my my hope is that the the foundation world, which has been sort of slow to pick up on this, um, and the Democratic National Committee under our next president, uh, will help to fund and fuel and encourage this upsurge of grassroots organizing all over the country. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so that it, and so as I said before, so the anti-Trump resistance movement becomes a persistence movement. Yeah, good, good. So, you know, I just want to uh, end by harking back on the democracy issues that you talked about in uh, a little bit in Seattle and then around mm -hmm. redistricting. Uh, for folks who are uh, still on or watching, <coughs> you might want to check out Nick Nyhart's article uh, from a few weeks ago in the American Prospect talking about uh, the Seattle City Council election mm -hmm. and right. how an outspent progressive slate won almost all of the seats. Yes. Right. And he attributes uh, a democracy reform in Seattle, which is democracy dollars. Andrew Yang's proposal actually exists in Seattle yeah. where people, uh, I forget what it is, maybe get $50 or $100 that they yeah. can devote to their candidate. Right. And that enabled financial support but also spurred organization on the progressive side and at, you know at the ash center we uh talk a lot about democracy reform issues like redistricting like money in politics yeah. and we didn't get to explore the theme although i believe it's true if you're a democratic socialist your prospects are much better with the basic structures of ordinary small yeah. d democracy in yeah. place to yeah. have that contest of ideas right. and this is um, the first venture in exploring democratic socialism at the Ash Center as an effort to catch up a little bit. The intellectual debate uh, in some of these places is behind what's happening in our democracy in the sense right. that there are a much wider range of ideas now right. being offered by candidates on the right and the left right. than, um, than intellectuals are used to talking right. to. And so we owe a, a great deal of thanks. Uh, thanks, Peter, for uh, kicking off this part of the discussion, trying right. to catch us up to uh, try to understand exactly what democratic socialism is in our time. Thank, Thank you. you, Peter. Great. Good. Thank you.